Good morning, folks. Relatively quiet day on our star, not so quiet beneath our feet. We've got news and what to watch for here today, but we're starting at spaceweathernews.com and we find the last 24 hours on the sun. Very quiet, except for the Earth-facing coronal hole, which directly connected to Earth yesterday with its interplanetary magnetic fields. The only activity on the sun was a filament snapping to lower latitudes on the northeastern limb. So we go to the solar wind, and it's comparably quiet. Small rise in plasma pressure this morning is still in very mild range, and so the geomagnetic response is minor as well. Big quakes struck Mexico yesterday. The death toll is still rising, and damage sifted through. Not only did we get blood echoes preceding the event to hit the model, but QuakeWatch.net forecaster Rebecca Jo Steelman nailed this one in her prediction too. Best wishes to those affected. Interesting paper out of South Africa here looking at their own power system vulnerability to geomagnetically induced currents. Turns out they believe they can gauge individual and total power station risk to both single time events and accumulated damage. The lone issue is they max out at the 100 year solar storm peak, which we know might be 10 times weaker than the Carrington event in 1859, 20 to 50 times weaker than the super flare. Little interesting note, they have found a new molecule in space, but its discovery is really the only cool part. In fact, we are far more likely to find this organic compound in space than here on Earth. Out there, it's stable. Here, its high reactivity ends its existence quickly. Let's go to the LIGO team. Folks with the math and scientific contradictions of neutron stars and black holes, both needing to fundamentally change in their formation, evolution, and physical character, it's always really hard to know what's a guess and what's legit when we get a story like this. For example, the key story here is that the smaller of these objects is 2.6 solar masses, they think, which puts it in the gap where they haven't seen before such an object in this orbital predicament. Keep that in mind as the guess is based on distance, and we'll come back to that in the final story today. But first, thesis postings online take forever to read, but you can always learn something from them. This is how someone gets a PhD, the final major hurdle. And this one identifies a number of cosmology issues that are facing the cold dark matter model, hopefully a future contributor here to real science. They've tied a major volcano eruption in Alaska to one of the coldest periods in recent history. A few decades into the BC era, they endured an incredible and rapid climate shift that pretty much lasted a decade. A 2.5 to 3 degree drop from their peak on this chart 15 years earlier, and another 2 degrees colder than the famous Roman warming period. Now, last but not least, that distance I mentioned. One thing that screws up cosmology is not knowing how far away some things are. Folks, this one's going to A and A, but our preprint preview today shows that dust in the line of sight can cause a 40% scatter in distance estimations using the best methods known. And uh, that's just in our own galaxy. Uh-oh. And speaking of uh-oh, Dr. Robitaille's next special video is coming out today. Subscribe to Sky Scholar to stay up to date. If you didn't see our open letter and video to Dr. Bell, president of the AGU, I recommend that one. It's linked right below the video. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now. It's 5 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.